Thank you very much indeed. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's lovely to be in this beautiful hall, which I have not yet had the chance to see, so I'm really delighted um, to have the opportunity to come in and talk to you before the evening's concert. I'm Katie Hamilton, um, and I'm going to be telling you about what is on the programme for this evening's concert. Um, I suspect you're probably aware that, alas, Louise Alder, who was originally scheduled to perform this evening, um, is unable to be with us because of illness. Um, so we're delighted to have Nicola Hillebrand, who's um, very kindly filling in um, and is going to be performing a programme for you entirely of German leader, um, namely of leader by Franz Schubert, Johannes Brahms and Richard Strauss. So my job is to tell you about this programme, um, because obviously text will be available later, but look on me as your speaking programme note for the evening, um, as it were. And um, so we're going to move in, the, the, the concert consists of a first half of works by Schubert and Brahms, and then a second half of works by Richard Strauss. So I will talk you through the songs um, roughly in the order that they're going to be coming up. Those of you who were in our study event early on this morning, um, where I was very lucky to be joined by our leader, leader young artists who very kindly took part with me giving the talk, um, many of the elements that we were looking at in that study session about the importance of the natural world in lyric poetry and thus the poetry that many of our song composers are using, early 19th century poetry, many of those same elements come up in this evening's programme. So uh, plenty of flowers, of birds, moonlight, the sea, and of course, lots of people in love. Um, but in addition to kind of generally giving you an overview of what's coming, I do want to talk a little bit about the spaces, the people, the performers and audiences of this repertoire, because we move from music that is very much intended for domestic spaces, for amateur performers, at the beginning of the 19th century when the lead was primarily a domestic and private affair and very infrequently featured on concert programmes. And if it did, it was one or two items in a miscellaneous programme that was otherwise instrumental chamber music. Right through to the other end of the 19th century in the very beginning of the 20th century with some of the Strauss songs that we're going to hear, where we have much more outward-looking, outward-facing music written for big spaces, dedicated to professional opera singers, um, and in at least one case, a song that was actually written with orchestral accompaniment first and then reduced, as it were, down to being a song for voice and piano. And we also have songs that we know were um, intended for or prompted by or inspired by the composers thinking of specific individuals or friends who recommended poetic sources that were then picked up on and set to music. If you think you've worked out in advance which composers are the domestic small-scale ones and which composers are the great big um, operatic stage ones, um, I'm delighted to say we're going to begin with a curveball um, because the first song that we're going to hear this evening by Franz Schubert, the man we most associate with the Schubertiad, with the domestic convivial space, is in fact a song that has been effectively rescued from a lost, very large-scale public stage work. And that is um, a number called Der Vollmond strahlt, The Full Moon Shines, composed as part of the incidental music for the play Rosamunde. Now, the author of the play, and thus the author of this song text, was Helmina von Cetzi, who had provided the libretto for Weber's opera Euryante in 1823. On, in October, this opera was performed in Vienna, and Schubert went to see it. Um, the day after the performance, it seems that Schubert was given the opportunity to meet Weber, who not unsurprisingly asked Schubert what he thought. And I was going to say Schubert being young and naive. I mean, he was 26, so he wasn't that young and naive. Anyway, he was slightly tactless, to put it mildly, and basically told Weber that he thought that Die Freischutz was better. Um, and consequently, um, as a result of that, the two men didn't really become the kind of firm friends that we might hope. Um, in the meantime, after this performance of Euryanta, where the music was not as well received, Schubert was kind of on the money, it was not as well received as Der Freischutz and some of Weber's earlier operas had been, then Foncetti's libretto was partially blamed for that. So she decided that she was going to make a hit as fast as possible. She was going to persuade the Austrian capital that, that they really did need Helmina Foncetti stage works. And so she wrote and turned around within a couple of months for production her new work, Rosamunde Fürsten von Sipan, 
um, Princess of Cyprus, that was then performed two months after Euryanthe in December, on the 20th of December, um, 1823. It was then repeated on the 21st of December, 1823, and then it sank without trace. Um, we don't even know the finer details of the plot anymore because actually there is no surviving complete script of Rosamunde. Um, in other words, it was, alas, a total flop and vanished pretty much overnight. But Schubert's music was not a total flop and in fact in several of the very lengthy reviews that went to town taking to bits why Rosamunde was not a very successful stage work, Schubert's music was continually um, picked out as being the highlight of the pr 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 production and the performance. Um, and indeed, the overture and the incidental music is still performed in concerts now. There was a gap between the first performance and that happening because the parts, uh, the orchestral parts had vanished and they were rediscovered in the 1860s, long after Schubert had died, by Arthur Sullivan and George Grove who were in Vienna and found them in a drawer um, in the way of these things and made new copies and performed them then. Um, one of the entrechts for Rosamunde is the theme that belongs to the Rosamunde string quartet and also one of the piano um, intermezzi, impromptu, sorry. Um, and the vocal numbers, including the song that we're going to hear this evening, um, that those were published in about 1830, so not so many years after the first performance. Um, so we hear Der Vollmondstrahls at the beginning of the programme this evening, sung by Rosamunde herself, who has been brought up, although she's a princess, she's been brought up as a shepherdess, unaware of her noble origins, um, and she's visiting Aksa, the, the maid, the, the sort of nursemaid who raised her um, out in the countryside when she sings this very beautiful, um, rather pastoral song to the moon, um, of course, there's an evil rival for her throne. The story is largely about her trying to become the first in von Zipa, as she, she should be. Of course, there's a love interest. Um, in terms of the poem itself that you're going to hear tonight, look out for the moon and the mountain tops. Look out for the comparisons that Rosamunde inevitably makes between May and the far greater, fairer, more beautiful wonder of her lover. Um, because whatever she may have hoped, Chelsea was not so original a lyric poet that she was playing with entirely new ideas here. There's actually another Chetzi connection in one of the other Schubert leader we're going to hear tonight, and that is Heimliches Lieben, which is a relatively late song. Um, it sets a poem by Wilhelmine von Chetzi's mother, Caroline von Klenke. And this is a song very much aimed at the domestic end of the market. Um, Schubert wrote it for a pianist um, and salonier called Marie Pachler, um, he met them in met the, the Pachler family in 1827 and got to know the children quite well, as well as Marie, whose piano playing he much admired. And this was one of her favourite poems, and it was among a little group of leader that Schubert wrote specifically for her and her family. We're also going to hear Andy Lauter to the lute, um, another relatively late song from 1827. And this is a song in which we have a performance set up because this is an evening serenade, and our serenader is playing his lute, singing his song, but he's actually addressing the song not to his beloved's window, of course, where the main thing is being aimed. What we hear is him singing a song literally to his lute, coaxing his music from the strings up into the ears of the beloved in the hope of um, her hearing every single word and every feeling every ounce of his passion for her, but crucially, as he repeats several times in the last line, the neighbours mustn't hear him. <laughs> so it's a very specifically aimed sonic signal from the lute up to um, his sweetheart's window. Messages are also at the heart of Die Blumensprache, um, a rather earlier song, and we're told rather straightforwardly in this that flowers reveal the feelings of the heart. They speak many a secret word. And there was plenty of wisdom by this point in time um, as to the specific meanings of various flowers. Um, the poet of this particular poem, um, Anton Plattner, doesn't mention specific um, flowers in the way that we looked uh, this morning in, this, in the study session at rosemary, at roses, at myrtles for marriage, and so on and so forth. But he does manage to imply a very strong connection between the behavior of a tender, innocent young bud and the behavior of a tender, innocent young girl. 
uh, which of course is the other role that flowers often play in poetry of this period. They stand in for the pure, innocent, sweet maiden. And again, they may have been an intended recipient for this, namely Carolina von Esterhazy, one of the two Esterhazy sisters uh, to whom Schubert gave piano lessons for several years in the 18 teens. And it said that he fell in love with Carolina, in which case a song about the love messages that flowers could transmit seems entirely appropriate. Of our remaining Schubert settings, one is very well known indeed, and that is Gretchen am Spinrade, um, which really needs very little introduction, composed when Schubert was just 17 years old and capturing with astonishing insight and profundity of feeling the desperate kind of passion and unrest that Gretchen, the heroine of Goethe's Faust, feels as she sits at her spinning wheel um, thinking about this man who she's fallen for and trying to kind of understand the state that she now finds herself in. Whilst the kind of pain in Gretchen am Spinrade is to do with a love so strongly felt that she doesn't really know what to do with it, we're also treated to two very different romantic scenarios as well. In Du liebst mich nicht, you do not love me, and Erster Verlust, so in Du liebst mich nicht, it's a lover rejected, and as Graham Johnson, who I know was, was speaking to you just yesterday, um, as Graham Johnson has very compellingly written, this is a song in which, although it's a song of heartbreak, you don't love me, it's all sort of tragedy and woe, there is something quite obsessive about the piano writing, as if this really was not a kind of straightforward and healthy romantic love in the first place. There's something a bit unsettling, a bit not quite stalkerish, but absolutely kind of focused obsession in a rhythm that we keep getting around and around and around playing in the piano. And then in Erster Verlust, we have the happy times being past. Um, our speaker is left bereft, wondering how to claim again these, these wonderful hours that now seem to be so distantly historical that there's sort of no way of getting them back. And again, this is a song of a real emotional depth and complexity from an 18-year-old Schubert, very, very young. And this was a song that he included, along with Gretchen am Spinrader, in the volume of poems, uh, settings of Goethe poems that he actually sent to Goethe in 1816, which gives us a sense of how highly he valued Erster Verlust, as well as Gretchen and some of the others, um, in his song output to date. We end our Schubert group with a rather curious number from 1828, the last year of his life, called Die Männer sind méchants, which is going to mash up the French and the German a little, méchant, if you want to pronounce it in a German way. And it's curious because it's a rare example of a very deliberate attempt on Schubert's part, and indeed on the publisher's and marketer's part, of trying to write a funny song. So Schubert is witty in passing often, but he's not somebody we sort of straightforwardly associate with comic song. And this was one of four songs, refrain, refrain leader, um, that he was commissioned to write in 1828 to be witty and light-hearted and intended for sort of convivial domestic performance. Um, and it's an interesting one. I mean, it's, it's definitely more perhaps um, witty or méchant, one might translate as kind of naughty, um, because men, as we all know, men are naughty. And as our heroine refers at the end of each verse, as we are told of the various goings on between her and her lover, um, firstly, they meet, there's eyes made at each other, there's hands held, there's lips kissed, and then there's a series of ellipses because men are naughty. Um, so, you know, it's a, a comedy is a funny one because, of course, comedy shifts with every passing month, every year, every decade or century. Titillating, perhaps, witty, most certainly, is what we have in this song. Uh, lots of pantomime winks in the piano part to listen out for in that one. Then we turn to a group of songs by Johannes Brahms, um, who obviously is the next generation on, born in the 1830s, Schubert born in the 1790s. Many of the songs on tonight's programme, not just the Brahms leader, but within the Schubert and Strauss as well, have an explicitly female protagonist. It's very clear that it is a woman who's singing, that they are Mädchenlieder, broadly conceived. But these women vary hugely in outlook and behaviour. So we start with Treue Liebe, True Love, a song written uh, when Brahms was 19 years old, so sort of comparable, if you like, with some of the Schubert songs. 
This is a sad tale of a young maiden waiting on the seashore for the return of her beloved. Eventually, she walks into the waves, and it's made clear to us from the narrator's perspective that he too, a sailor perhaps or someone on a long journey, has drowned and that they are reunited in the sea. Um, you hear in the piano to begin with the water sort of lapping at her feet and then gradually as the music goes on the waves rise over her head which is to say that the, the piano figuration is wrapping uh, this kind of wrapping around of arpeggio figures gets higher and higher and higher until it overtakes the vocal line and she is subsumed by the waves. So she is a young woman prepared to die for love, to be reunited with her beloved. But she has fairly little character beyond the fact that she is a woman who wishes to be with her lover. And we don't really have much of a more rounded sense of her as a personality than that. She's relatively subservient, in other words, as all good young ladies should be, hence the naughty behaviour of um, the character in the Schubert song. By contrast, Von Ewiger Liebe, one of Brahms' best-known songs, has a very different kind of heroine, a heroine of tremendous courage and strength and passion at a point when her lover is afraid and unsure of the future of their relationship because she is the one who reassures him that their love is unbreakable, unchangeable, and ever-enduring. Iron and steel, she says, can melt, can be changed, can smash, smash and shatter but our love will endure long beyond that. And this was something that impressed reviewers of the song, even when it was first published in 1868. Um, one of them remarking that the eternal love that she mentions is something that cannot be doubted, having heard her speak. And the reviewer says, what a deep impression that relatively simple means can create. So this is a classic example of Brahms um, bringing a poem to life very vividly in the, the kind of the strength of will of his central character, but also writing music of incredible economy. Um, and this is something he gets more and more um, skilled and brilliant at as his career goes on. There are never too many notes, but of course the trick is making sure that you only leave the right ones left, um, which he does with absolute beauty and surety in this song. It may seem a little surprising also to spot the name Zalome among Brahms's songs. That's a name we rather more readily associate with Richard Strauss and certainly not with the polite world of middle-class leader domestic music making um, in the 1870s. But Brahms's Zalome was um, written in the 1870s to a text by the poet Gottfried Keller. And Keller was a man Brahms knew personally, as he did many of his poets and who was particularly noted for his strong, complex female characters at a time when they were rather few and far between in German lyric poetry. Despite the title, the poem does not actually set us a scene with the biblical Zalome. There are no heads on platters in this particular number. Um, but there is no doubt as soon as she starts to speak, this is a woman who means business, and this is not a woman to be messed with. Um, she wishes to be in love, she wishes to be brought a lover, and she is going to deal with him. He shall see how a love can become as fiery as a sword, she says in the last verse. And each animal that her, her lover could become, she will become something fiercer in order to capture him and deal with him. Now, Brahms has actually done a very good job here because this is a rather unusual and very strong position for a woman to take, particularly a woman named Zalome in the poem, as Keller does. Um, this is a rather risky poem to set to music, given the kind of circumstances in which it may have been performed. So he does a rather good job of kind of clothing her in slightly pseudo-rustic musical setting, because there are certain sorts of behaviour that you can get away with if you're sort of folk-type character than if you're a genteel young lady. And it's not the only time Brahms manages to pull this trick off after getting sl sort of slapped on the wrist by a friend of his for... Um, writing a music for an, in a, an other inappropriate poem, and, she, and her, his friend said to her, um, him, surely this is only appropriate in a folk style. So Brahms here runs with that and um, makes for this rather different kind of musical setting, and it obviously worked because his very good friend, Theodor Billroth, a very distinguished surgeon and a very fine amateur musician, not only wrote to Brahms congratulating him on this wonderful kind of folksy uh, song, but also allowed his children to sing it with impunity. <laughs> so, coast was clear in the end, after all. 
We're going to hear three other Brahms songs in the first half, all have interesting connections to his sort of broader output in compositional ideas. So we have Es träumt er mir, which is the setting of a text by Georg Friedrich Dahlmer, who was Brahms' favourite poet, and who made countless, inverted commas, translations of <coughs> folk poetry from Europe and from Russia, as well as writing um, uh, versions of poetry, Persian poetry, by Hafiz. We're also going to hear Da Unten im Tale, which is a folk melody which appears three times in Brahms's catalogue. In the first version we hear tonight for solo voice and piano, published right at the end of his life in his big collection of Volkslieder. In a version for female voices only, female ensemble, which was made in the late 1850s when Brahms was still living in Hamburg and had his own Frauenchor, his own female voice choir, for which he composed and arranged a great deal of music and it pops up again throughout his, um, his output in various different forms. He revisits this material. And then there's also a version of the same melody with the same words for um, SATB, for mixed choir. He even then went back to the poem and wrote his own melody, um, which is published under the title of Trennung uh, in the 1880s. So it was a text that really interested him, and clearly a melody, which you'll hear this evening, is utterly beautiful and beguiling, that kept drawing him back to making different arrangements. Similarly, that extremely famous lullaby, the Wiegenlied, which is the other Brahms song you're going to hear, has a slightly more complicated history than you might think, because it was written in the 1860s as a Wiegenlied for a friend who was about to have her second child. Fair enough, seems like a perfectly reasonable setup for writing a cradle song. But this friend, Berta Porubski, as she was when Brahms first met her, had been a member of the Hamburger Frauenchor in the late 1850s, when she had visited Hamburg from Vienna, where she was from. And whilst she was visiting Hamburg in the late 1850s, she sang songs for Brahms, folk songs and popular songs, and waltz songs. And when Brahms came to write the vegan lead in the 1860s for her and her husband, he incorporated elements of one of the Viennese dance songs that she had sung him in the late 1850s and worked it into the lullaby, which is one of the reasons why it has this very kind of lilting, slightly waltzy 3-4 feel in the way that it's put together. And of course, later Brahms takes the same theme and reworks it in the first movement of his second symphony, which he calls a theme for naughty or sickly children, because he puts it in the minor key and therefore it's more serious and it belongs in a symphony. The second half of the concert focuses on the music of Richard Strauss, born when Brahms was 31. And indeed, Strauss was a great admirer of Brahms' music as a young man, but because he lived for so much longer, lived through to the late 1940s when he writes the four last songs in 1948, Strauss kind of takes us up to the end of the, the great period of blossoming of lyric romantic song, by which time it has become a wholly public pretty much wholly professional, certainly by the 40s, genre in Strauss's hands, potentially with orchestra on a big stage and with a healthy dollop of Wagner in the mix and later on modernist thinking in the mix, particularly after he'd written Salome and Elektra at the beginning of the 20th century. But even Strauss, who was born into a world that hadn't quite yet seen the arrival of the Liederabend, the idea that singers would command an entire concert and perform songs one after the other without anybody else to support them. Imagine such a thing. That is an invention of the 1870s and 80s. Even Strauss was a man who grew up in a world of domestic music making. And we're going to hear quite a few songs this evening from the 1880s and 1890s, where we can hear him sort of finding his way from the domestic space of song making uh, into a more public world, which requires a more operatic vocal style and eventually orchestra as well. And of course, Strauss was to marry an opera singer, Pauline de Arne. They met in the late 1880s, and that puts her in the picture for most of the songs that we're going to hear this evening. And indeed, he accompanied her a great deal and other singers, both at the piano and on the podium later on once he'd orchestrated some of these songs. Now, as I say, most of the songs we're going to hear tonight were written in the 1880s and 90s when Strauss was in his 20s and 30s. Flicking through the copious catalogue, he was amazingly prolific um, during this period. There's some really interesting juxtaposition of songs, many songs, both to well-known older poets, Hulti, Goethe, Uhland, and others, and those by his contemporaries, 
and also those big orchestral works, those symphonic poems of Strauss finding his own orchestral style. So Death and Transfiguration, Don Juan, Don Quixote, Till Oil and Spiegel, these are all in the mix in between the song opuses that we hear this evening. And there's also arrangements too. He's constantly um, fiddling around with making arrangements of Beethoven and Schubert and other music. So this is a really rich time of learning and exploration. And it's one of the reasons why the songs are so varied in their approach to the voice and the piano. The earliest song we're going to hear is one of Strauss's most famous, Aller Seelen, composed in 1885, part of his first published opus of songs, Opus 10. Um, he's 21 years old when he writes this. Um, and the fact that he's only 21 years old um, gives us a sense of the fact that already there's a kind of orchestral sense in the piano writing. He later orchestrates it. Also from the 1880s, we've got Stentchen, another famous song composed um, the year after Aller Seelen. That became so popular during Strauss's lifetime that he got thoroughly fed up with it. He was very proud of it when he wrote it and ended up being rather rude about it in later life, like Paul Bruch and that one violin concerto uh, that follows one around like a sort of ghoul. Um, but in Stentchen, we have gentle shimmering in the piano, um, in, as we hear in the poem, a kind of stillness described, the stillness of the brook, the breeze, the sleeping flowers. Gradually, it becomes apparent that the uh, fluttering that we hear in the piano, the shimmering is not the landscape, it's love itself. Only love is awake, the poet says. And that is what we have been listening to and um, playing in the piano from the beginning of the song. And when he was in his mid-twenties, Strauss composed the four songs of Mädchenblumen, to a clutch of poems by Felix Dahn, a very popular writer of the day, still alive at the time, um, and a frequent contributor to Die Gartenlaube, which was Germany's most popular family magazine and contained frequently poetry, artwork, songs um, that everybody in the family, if you like, could enjoy. Strauss's biographer, Norman Delmar, rather sardonically describes Mädchenblumen as a song cycle in which Dahn sentimentally rhapsodizes over different sorts of girls in terms of their botanical equivalents. <laughs> um, which is not all that unfair. We are presented with a cornflower, a poppy, ivy, and water rose. But Strauss renders these very exquisitely, even if the poetry itself is not perhaps the finest poetry available. Um, and particularly um, the water rose, the Wasserhose, the fourth song, is very, very beautiful indeed. What's most intriguing about this set is that Dan's poems are precisely the kind of fodder that are suitable for gentle, amateur-friendly settings of the kind that were still very much in fashion at the time, not to mention ideal for a beautifully painted um, cover with all of the flowers depicted on the front. But although Strauss reigns in his ambitions a little bit here in terms of scale and orchestral palace in the keyboard, it is not an easy set to perform. So if it was aimed at domestic performance, it really was for the homes of excellent singers and pianists only. And in fact, Strauss dedicated it not to a close friend who was an amateur music maker, but to the court opera singer Hans Giesen, who had recently sung in the, in the premiere of Strauss's first opera, Guntram. So it's a mark of just how far the lead has come since the early 19th century that even a sort of bouquet of this kind is now basically beyond the reach of most amateur musicians. And of the remaining songs on the program, two feature poetry by long dead poets, well known to Schubert, namely Das Rosenband, which in fact Schubert also sets. Um, this is the song that Strauss writes initially with orchestra and then reduces down to being for voice and piano. And Schlechter's Wetter, Bad Weather, Terrible Weather, to a Heine poem, which was published um, in 1918 as part of an opus that also included a Strauss setting of the Heine poem Mein Wagen rollt langsam, which is best known in a setting by Robert Schumann. Then we have two poems by contemporaries, Schlagende Herzen, where we hear the beating of the lover's heart, not a sort of low drum sounds in the piano, but tinkling little bells, mentioned in the um, text and then very um, wonderfully picked up by Strauss in the piano. And Ich Schwebe, I, I Float, um, which is set as a floating waltz. In fact, the music was taken from an abandoned ballet sketch that Strauss has started to put together. So it really does dance along. And these were poem, poems by Karl Friedrich Henkel and Otto, uh, Julius Otto Bierbaum. And Bierbaum in 1901, a few years after Strauss had written this song, would be one of the founders of the Überbrettel Cabaret. So an interesting kind of moment musically in terms of the sorts of songs that were being written. 
We've also got Meinem Kinder, which was composed in 1897 in anticipation of the birth of Richard and Paulina's son Franz. And it's sort of Strauss's answer to the vegan needs. So very tender, intimate little song. And here we have a song that really has no scope beyond the intimate family gathering in the room. Um, he made a chamber arrangement, a small scale chamber arrangement, as well as the version you hear tonight for piano. And that leaves just the final number of the concert for this evening, which is Strauss's Morgan. But I don't think I'll say anything at all about that, because after all, the song itself tells us some moments can only be met by speechlessness. And in any case, I think I've delighted you all long enough. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.